Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our food system seminar and somehow week seven of our quarter talking about food supply chains during the COVID-19 pandemic. So here we are back at our familiar FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization framework of food systems. And today we're gonna to have an opportunity to look at some of the influences and drivers of food systems beyond the focus on food supply chains specifically and uh, food environments that we've been digging into, but really to think about um, the influences and drivers that ultimately impact, as you see down here at the bottom, not just food access, but considering outcomes even beyond sustainability and what's wrapped up within the Sustainable Development Goals to actually consider sovereignty or essentially self-governance. And I have just um, a couple of slides to help continue introducing this concept before I actually get to introduce our esteemed guests for today. Um, so just picking up from the last slide, you'll recall that we have been discussing the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, and the United Nations 2030 Agenda. And previously, we've looked at those through the lens of food and agriculture and um, seen that all of the Sustainable Development Goals can actually be viewed uh, by looking at food system issues. And today, we have the opportunity to actually still continue a food and agriculture theme, of course, but to center Indigenous peoples broadly and local tribal nations specifically. So um, I wanted to point out that there has been a great deal of engagement, in fact, um, and the creation of a, of a permanent forum on Indigenous issues to learn more about the essential and fundamental intersections between Indigenous issues, including human rights and sovereignty, um, and this global agenda around sustainability. So I encourage you to um, check out some of these links and, um, and pursue the resources that we're providing here if you're interested in this global scale. But of course, um, as we constantly move between scales in this class, we're gonna move from that global perspective and we're gonna zoom back into the place where many of us are located to acknowledge the original peoples of the lands where the University of Washington is located, um, but also consider the lands where our guests today are located. So um, here in the middle, we are now familiar with this region of the Salish Sea and the Coast Salish original peoples um, who are still here, of course. And today we're looking just south of this area to um, the traditional ancestral lands of the Chinook and other tribes and nations. Um, and I'm not going to read out the whole list, but there is um, an incredibly rich history of tribes and nations that today exist uh, in the form of confederated tribes and in the form of various tribes and nations of those lands. And I encourage you to check out um, the resource that I've mentioned before that's I think just co been covered up, but um, nativeland.ca uh, is the website where you can get more information about some of these um, or, or for some of these maps that I share in class. So with that, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce uh, the topic for today and our speakers. Um, the title of today's talk is COVID-19 Food Access Among American Indian Alaska Native Tribes in Washington State, The Value of Food Sovereignty. And we have two guests with us today, Nora Frank Buckner and Victoria Warren Mears. Nora is a Nez Perce tribal member and a Klamath tribal descendant. She began working for the Health Authority in, or the Health Board, I'm sorry, in January 2015 and is the Food Sovereignty Initiatives Director. Nora graduated from Oregon State with a Bachelor of Science uh, in Public Health focused in health promotion and health behavior. Um, she has such a wealth of experience and background, and I encourage you to read and review her bio in full, and it's posted on our Canvas site. Our second speaker for the day is Victoria Warren Mears, and uh, Dr. Warren Mears is the director of the Northwest Tribal Epicenter, um, a position that she has held for over 14 years. And so as the director, she has the specific responsibility of managing the Epi Center. I'm sorry, I just actually got that not epicenter, epicenter, <laughs> um, and, um, and uh, focuses on um, 
the progress of Northwest Indian health programs toward meeting the health status objectives of the Indian Health Care Improvement Act. Uh, Dr. Warren Mears is also an RD, nutritionist, and has taught at universities. Um, I encourage you to review her impressive bio in detail as well, which is posted on Canvas. And with that, I'll just share one more warm welcome to our guests. Thank you through snow and sleet and all the challenges of this year. Thank you so much for being with us. I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that you can pull up your slides. Um, and I will be in the background here, uh, enjoying and appreciating your talk. Thank you so much. Great, well, thank, thank you. you so much for that warm welcome. And um, I'm going to be the kickoff speaker for this uh, seminar. And we, while we're thrilled to be coming to you from our home offices here in Portland, we would be equally thrilled to be able to travel to visit you. And so hopefully our paths will cross in the future and hopefully the not terribly distant future. Next slide, please. I'd like to provide today a little overview of the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and the Northwest Tribal Epi Center. Um, and indeed, um, there is that slight distinction in pronunciation. So we're not where earthquakes start, but rather where epidemiology is studied. So. We're um, happy to be here and are thrilled to be able to share a bit of our story with you today. So the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board is a tribal organization, meaning that it's a membership organization of the 43 federally recognized tribes in the states of Idaho, Oregon, and Washington. It was founded in 1972 out of a desire for tribal leaders to have um, more advocacy and more access and a unified body to advocate for good in uh, American Indian Alaska Native health and for federal advocacy as well. So we've been around for quite some time and we're proud as an organization to have membership of each of the tribes in our three state region represented on our board. We are um, comprised of the 43 sovereign nations and then we report to an executive director. So it's an interesting organizational structure that is almost like working for the United Nations. And we'll talk more about the sovereign nation status as we move forward. Next slide, please. So the Tribal Epidemiology Centers or Epicenters or TECs as we call ourselves were established through the Indian Healthcare Improvement Act and initiated in 1996 through legislation. And our first funding year was in 1997. So there were four initial texts of which the Northwest Tribal Epidemiology Center was one. And there are now 12 throughout the United States. Each of the tribal epidemiology centers functions independently, but we do meet together as part of a national consortium, which we call the Tech C. And so we do try to make um, programmatic decisions and recommendations collectively that we think are the in the best interest of American Indian Alaska Native people, regardless of whether their living location is at their tribe or at an urban center. Next slide, please. This is a map that shows you um, a bit about where the tribal epidemiology centers are located. Our locations correspond to the Indian Health Service um, service areas. And so each of those service areas are named for the city in which the, um, the headquarters of that branch of Indian Health Service is. So our area is called the Portland area. And contrary to popular belief, it doesn't mean that we just serve the city of Portland, Oregon, but rather we serve the three tribes, Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, which comprise the Portland Area of Indian Health Service. And we are keenly aware that our map is skewed a little bit here. We do know that Alaska and Hawaii don't sit down where they are in the map, but merely to point out that Alaska also has a tribal epidemiology center and there's similar work that occurs for Native Hawaiians um, in the Hawaiian Islands, although not part of our 12 epicenters that are serving the populations. 
So as you can see, the 12 epicenters are located um, on this map in a variety of different places throughout the nation. The notable exception to the service area um, designation is the Navajo Nation located in Arizona, Utah, Colorado, and New Mexico, which has its own epidemiology center. So that's in the Four Corners region of the Southwest. And because of that, the Intertribal Council of Arizona serves the Phoenix area and the Tucson area of Indian Health Service. In addition, there's one other epidemiology center, which is designated as the Urban Indian Health Institute, which some of you may be familiar with, um, at least in the media in Seattle. Um, and they serve urban Indian health organizations throughout the United States and so have been doing a lot of great media work advocating for urban American Indian Alaska Native people. Next slide, please. So the tribal epidemiology centers are public health authorities. And so in the um, Indian Healthcare Improvement Act, which was attached to the Patient Protection Affordable Care Act in 2010, we were permanently authorized as public health authorities. And in the quote that's shown on your slide, the secretary refers to the Secretary of Health and Human Services for the federal government that grants each of the epicenters access to data and data sets and other protected health information that are under the purview of that secretary. So it's a very um, limited public health authority to uh, support tribal nations and urban Indian people in data um, predominantly. So the tech directive gives access to that tech data. So we have access to a variety of health systems now, um, including some access to Tiberius, which you may have all heard of, which is the vaccine system on the federal level. And we have access to HHS Protect, which also is the COVID system on the federal level. So it allows us to look at data for American Indian Alaska Native people, and that access for our um, particular epicenter is limited to our region that we serve. We also um, have the requirement through this legislation that the Center for Disease Control and Prevention, or CDC as it's commonly known, must provide the tribal epicenters with technical assistance should we request it. And that has proven quite helpful during the pandemic and this, this provision of technical assistance not only applies to the text public health authority, but also to individual tribes public health authority. And we've seen many teams from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention deployed to our Northwest tribes during our pandemic. Also, um, as I previously mentioned, each of the Indian Health Service areas must have access to a tribal epidemiology center. So it's a program that's applied uniquely in Indian country and um, uniformly across the United States. Next slide, please. So I want to be super clear on this point and it's sometimes a point of confusion. Our role as public health authority as um, in the tribal epidemiology centers is at the request of our member tribes and that is for data and technical assistance. So what it does mean is I don't have public health authority to set up a public health laboratory, nor do I have the facilities. And quite frankly, it's not an area of expertise for me, so I actually don't have the desire to do so. Um, but when I say that, I should never say never because sometimes things change and you know who knows what the future might bring um, for our organization but it doesn't alter the tribe's public health authorities as sovereign nations, but is only supportive to it. So each tribe by virtue of there being a sovereign nation is their own public health authority for the people who reside on their reserves. And so that's an important thing to keep in mind and something that's important to consider as um, you might be looking at tribal responses to a variety of issues. Each tribe has the authority to govern as it wishes in its, in its jurisdiction. And so um, we've seen this applied to COVID in terms of the vaccine distribution, 
the um, distribution of vaccines may not exactly match what the um, federal government has suggested. There may be other priority populations and there are other places where this also occurs. The next slide, please. So again, I mentioned previously that the tribal epicenter was formed in 1996. And our tribal leaders were very forethinking in the Northwest in that they, they had formulated this idea and concept well prior to the um, provision of this Indian Health Service Act um, to form tribal epidemiology centers. So at our particular center, there was an epidemiology and research center prior to the funding that was um, through Indian Health Service, which is the funding that ties all of the texts together. We are housed within the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board, and we are more like a departmental designation. So when I talk about our tribal epicenter, it's about a department of people. Uh, and so it's our each epicenter is a different size and serves, uh, has a different number of staff and has different priorities. So we're not all uh, cookie cutters of one another, but rather different and tailored to the needs of our tribe and operating at the wish of our tribes in our region. So the Northwest Tech is guided by a public health committee and reports to the board of delegates, which again is one voting member from each of our 43 tribes. So as I mentioned, it functions as a departmental designation. And so right now we have about 55 employees with a little bit of continued growth going on. Um, we've expanded tremendously over the years and hope that we're providing services in a variety of areas, including food sovereignty, that are of great use to the tribes in our region. Next slide, please. So we have seven things we're actually supposed to be about through that funding from Indian Health Service, which as you might surmise is not all of our funding, but rather a small portion of our funding. Um, that is to collect data, to evaluate data and programs, to identify health priorities in partnership with our tribes, make recommendations for health service needs, make recommendations for improving the healthcare delivery system, which includes the urban IHS and tribal clinic programs or the ITU system as you'll hear it referred to. We also provide epidemiologic technical assistance to the tribes and to other tribal organizations and in fact to other nonprofits and state partners who might ask us for such technical assistance. And then also providing disease surveillance to tribes. And in our particular case, we do this in partnership with our three states. So we have relationships um, with all of our states and tremendous data sharing agreements and data use agreements that allow us to perform these functions. Next slide, please. So we want to move into a little dialogue with that overview of our Tribal Epidemiology Center that gives you a little bit of a background on the definitions that I've already used and that Nora will use moving forward. Um, so I will be asking the questions and then we'll be having a little bit of a dialogue or I may just leave it to Nora to answer these questions because um, she definitely has it well covered. But the first question that I'd like to ask you, Nora, is to describe from your view what tribal sovereignty is and if you can expand that into um, how that applies to food sovereignty. So what does that actually mean? Yeah, I really, I mean, both of you earlier have described a bit about what tribal sovereignty is, what that looks like, that each, um, tribal nation has its right to its own self-governance and what that looks like. And one definition that I've um, come across is that it, it refers to the right of American Indians and Alaska Natives to govern themselves. So the US Constitution recognizes that our tribe has distinct governments and they have, with a few exceptions, um, the same powers as federal and state governments to regulate their own internal affairs. And for me, why this is important is because this self-governance is extremely critical to tribal communities that want to continue to um, protect their unique culture and identities. 
because often if, especially if we're talking about food and food systems, um, there are a lot of federal regulations around um, food and food entering into a community, especially things like the schools or daycare or you know, even elders nutrition programs. And if, if tribes don't practice their sovereignty and do things like creating and developing their, their own food policy, their own food regulations and codes, then sometimes that means federal and state governments are gonna tell them how it's going to be done. And often that happens. And that might not be culturally relevant or appropriate. And so I always think about that and, and maybe we can talk about that more when we get into food sovereignty and, and the work that we're doing um, around things like the food distribution program on Indian reservations. Um, you might hear me call it FDIPR for short, yay for acronyms, right? <laughs> um, but how that, because they get food from the USDA and there are certain guidelines and it wasn't until most recent that they allowed traditional foods into this program. And, and just for background, it's a um, food assistance program. And so, you know, historically, you will hear about commodity foods in tribal communities. And oftentimes in the early, early days in its first beginning, I mean, the food was rancid and it was like old, you know, spoiled food and lard and flour and then you put that all together and us natives were like fry bread <laughs> so that's kind of where fry bread um it was born out of and no it's not a traditional food <laughs> but i mean it, it came from survival right and so you know tribes having that self-governance to run their programs the way that sees they see fit and critically or culturally relevant um is critical to when, when you're talking about feeding your people, so. Great, that's super, Nora. Um, that's a great description. And um, I, I like you pointing out particularly, and I know you'll go more into this about what is a traditional food and kind of what isn't a traditional food. Um, you would think that fry bread is a traditional food, but I think that all of the ingredients in fry bread were not things that grew very well in our region. Um, and certainly um, some of the um, parts that we might enjoy in our diet like sugar um, wasn't something that was produced here in that way. And so um, it'll be interesting to hear your perspective on um, when we get to the food sovereignty discussion about like, why was that a problem? What was, you know, what happened because of these foods being brought in by um, the colonizing population? And so it'll be interesting to hear about that. Mm -hmm. That's another question for you. And um, this one's actually a hot button for me too. So we both have, I think, pretty strong opinions about the terminology, um, but we come at it from different places. As you heard, Nora is a tribal member I am not, but have been fortunate enough to work for the tribes for the past 14 years. And so um, we bring two different worldviews to this question, I think, but I, I would like to ask you the question first, Nora, and then I can feed in into any gaps that um, might be, my perspective might be different. And so can you tell me what BIPOC means and you know, what does that mean to you and how does it, um, how does it affect you um, if someone uses that term either in a week, uh, meeting context or in a personal context? And then we'll talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think it's um, super important to, to bring this up. Um, and it, it's a fairly new jargony acronym <laughs> that has popped up and, and it stands for Black, Indigenous and People of Color. And you see it being used in many places now, like foundations, nonprofits, academia, um, state and federal government, um, just as examples. Uh, and in this slide, we put, you know, why <laughs> this term can be problematic. And I do want to clarify um, and note that these are all my personal feelings. <laughs> Victoria and I are going to talk about our personal feelings <laughs> for a moment, and it doesn't necessarily reflect, you know the Northwest Tech or the board as a whole organization, but this is just stuff that we have talked about recently with one another. Um, but I just think it's important to talk about these terms um, 
that often get made, I think with good intention, but it's otherwise a bit empty to me. And I, and I, when I first heard it, I kind of had this weird gut reaction and I didn't know how to explain it. Um, so it, it's taken a lot of reflection for me because it's used a lot, especially in food systems work um, and public health. And though I think it was coined in best intentions, to me, it's just another blanket or, or jargon um, term that basically lumps everyone who is non-white into this group. And to me and many other colleagues I've talked to, my own family, um, the term just feels empty and non-inclusive. So the intention was to be inclusive, but really I feel like it does the opposite. And just to dig, unpack that a little bit more, you know, why, why are the terms or the races black and indigenous specifically called out while everyone else is just lumped into this people of color category? And even the term indigenous, what are you saying when you, when you mean indigenous? Is it indigenous to all of North America or are you talking specifically United States? Um, and when we're talking about food systems work, I feel like the term can undermine how American Indian and Alaskan natives um, have a specific role in the food system and how that's different than other populations and other communities. And I think it also undermines other groups like our migrant farm workers and just lumping them all into these, this one group. Um, I think it suggests that we all have the same experience or that we're experiencing things in the same way. And that's not, that's not true. Um, we are not, we are not experiencing the food system in the same way, just as urban people don't experience the food system the same way as our rural counterparts, right? And so I think it fails to articulate the different ways that racialized people in America actually experience race and racism. And as an indigenous person, being lumped into a term like BIPOC can feel a lot like another form of erasure. Like we're just, we're just blanketing it. We're not really going to be specific about it. And it's, you know, it just doesn't feel good. So I, for me, someone might ask, okay, so what's a better term then? What term would you use? And to me, if you're talking about indigenous or American Indian people, then say that, <laughs> just say that. I think recognizing our differences and also recognizing that, that words and, and terminology matter no matter what field you're in. So I know there's a lot of folks probably listening in that aren't going into public health or aren't you know, necessarily thinking of being in the food system per se, but just no matter what field you're in or what your profession is, words matter. And I think we just need to think through some of these before we make it a wildly <laughs> overused term. Anyway, okay, I'm, I'm hopping off my soapbox now. <laughs> but a chance for you to respond. All right, well, I'll hop on to mine, Nora. How's that? We can each hop on to our response. So yeah, we'll trade. <laughs> so um, this term has been around for, I don't know, probably a few years now, but it's really gained a lot of momentum recently. And I perceive that the intention was good. So I want to say that going out. And this is just my, my own personal feelings, as Nora said. We are not representing our, the feelings of anyone at our organization or any of the tribes that we represent, really. But when I think about this um, term, for people who are American Indian Alaska Native, just in talking with coworkers, I have a lot of coworkers who if they could choose how you refer to them, would prefer to be referred to as a citizen of whatever tribal nation they belong to. So um, rather than even grouping Nora as an American Indian person, um, I might want to refer to her as a citizen of her nation. And so it's giving her that respect that she really is a citizen in two different places. The other thing that's problematic in my view, I think with the indigenous terminology is something that Nora alluded to. And 
while realizing that our borders between the United States, Canada, Mexico, and the um, Southern Americas are artificial and they were create they weren't here originally. There were no borders originally. And we certainly have tribal nations who um, people flowed back and forth into Canada and back and forth in the Southwest into Mexico. And we have nations today that serve people across both of those borders. But there are some really, um, there's some specific legal language and recognition about being an American Indian Alaska Native person. And so my concern and the reason why I prefer not to use the term BIPOC is that I feel like it takes away some of the power of being an American Indian or Alaska Native person. And even that terminology takes away a bit of the power because I'm not acknowledging even in our area that people could be from one of 43 tribes or they could be from a tribe that is not federally recognized. So there are all sorts of permutations in the way people identify. And to me, when I think of indigenous, that's everyone from you know the far northest most point in Canada all the way to the farthest south point in South America. And that um, describes a variety of cultures and um, you know, in the context of what we're talking about today, a variety of food systems. And so um, it's a very non-specific term to me. And so, um, yeah, it, it just doesn't feel so good. And so um, I appreciate, I guess, the efforts for the shorthand uh, because it's nice to have something that's easy to say. And you know, often I will go into the AIAN, which is our abbreviation that we use at the epicenter for American Indian Alaska Native. Again, not very personal, but a shorthand term to abbreviate that which we're trying to articulate. But I think it's really important when working cross-culturally as I am that you ask people how it is that they want to be referred to. And so there are people in our office who are perfectly fine being referred to as indigenous people, which is why Nora and I are telling you that this represents our viewpoint, not every single person in our office. So it's a matter of people's comfort and, and how they feel in terms of belonging. But I think it's important regardless of what your profession ends up being and whether or not you're just touching food sovereignty or touching public health, in some way or just a recipient of those services to realize that when you're using terminology that it has an impact on the people you're talking about. So if you really want to break down um, some of those cultural barriers, um, listening with humility about how people want to be addressed and how they would like to be referred to um, is extremely important. And I think it will really lend to um, your success or at least lead to further to fewer pitfalls. And I think it's important to realize um, that everyone makes mistakes, um, and just to to realize that you're bringing yourself to the table. I will never be competent in Nora's culture, nor would I expect to be. But I can be competent in my own culture and then listen to her culture. So I think that's just important to keep in mind. And I just want to give Nora a space if she has any response to me, and then if not, she can go on to the next question. No, I think that was good, and I think thank you for sharing your your perspective on that. Um, yeah, so what we'll move on. I know we have about I think twelve ish minutes um, to go through some of the uh, food sovereignty stuff that we are working on, and it'll make it all hopefully come together. Is why we gave you the. 10,000 foot viewpoint of our organization and boiling it down to our food sovereignty initiatives project. And um, so one definition that I hear often from a colleague that I work with very closely, Buck Jones with the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission is that food sovereignty refers to the rights of people to define how they will hunt, grow, gather, sell, or give away their food with respect to their own cultures and own systems of management of natural resources. And of course, as tribes are, are sovereign, as we have been discussing, um, and may interact differently with the food system, you know, our Coast Salish um, 
our Coast Salish people interact with their food system differently than our Plains tribes um, out, let's say in Idaho and to Montana. And um, they might have a different definition or um, come up against different access issues to their traditional food. And I can talk more about that. Um, whether they are a reservation-based tribe or a non-reservation-based tribe um, and, and what that might look like um, because there are some legal implications with that. Um, but I'll, I'll advance, or, Victoria, did you have anything you'd want to add before I hop to the next? No, I really value that that definition from Buck though. He is just in right on the ground floor there of doing work in the fisheries and so just is spot on with that definition so yeah please go ahead all right um okay so um with our food sovereignty initiatives um to back up so as part of the epidemiology center i started um with a project called called weave northwest and it was um, a grant funded project through CDC or cooperative agreement actually called Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country. And that was really upstream public health approaches to like chronic disease prevention. So the prevention of type two diabetes, prevention of heart disease and stroke, um, tobacco cessation and prevention, those type of things. And we were able to provide some funding to the tribes that we work with to work on projects within their own community for that um, prevention work. So as we were funding um, tribes, one of the main areas they focused in on was food systems work. So there was a lot of community gardens going in, uh, traditional foods programs, traditional foods and medicines going into the gardens. Uh, some Tribes were developing curricula because they already had really well established gardens and traditional food programs and wanted to create curriculum that they could share um, with other tribes throughout their region. Um, and, and out of that grew the need for more intertribal, you know, tribe to tribe sharing of these resources. Um, like I said, some of the tribes had community gardens for years and, you know, were expanding. And then other tribes were just starting out and, you know, we're just trying to figure out, okay, what kind of soil do I put in this garden bed to make these tomatoes grow really well, right? So they didn't want to recreate the wheel. Um, so as the need for more collaboration was happening, we created the Northwest Tribal Food Sovereignty Coalition. And so this is um, comprised of at least 27 of our 43 tribes that we work with. It might be more by now. Um, tribal organizations, universities like UW, WSU, University of Idaho and Oregon State University, and also ally organizations like EcoTrust, Forge Grown Food Network, and among others. Um, and we formed four new work groups this last year, specifically fo focusing in on policy work, education, media, and partnership building. And we'll begin to meet bi-monthly. Now, the policy piece is really focusing in on that sovereignty. Um, and we, I'm gonna skip on my bullet points a little bit down to the ATNI. So that's Affiliated Tribes of Northwest Indians. Um, and that's a consortium of tribes that meets um, tribes from Northern California, Oregon, Idaho, Washington, I think parts of Alaska and Montana even. And they come together a few times a year and they meet in committees to talk about some of the top policy platforms um, and agendas given their respective sector that they work in. So if it's health, we have a health committee that meets regularly to talk about top health issues and priorities of the Portland area. Um, and then there's education, there's natural resources, there's all these different committees. Well, we formed a food sovereignty subcommittee last year because we felt that there needed to be a separate committee to talk about specific policy issues that might relate specifically to food. I mean, there just wasn't a committee that had that, that focus. Um, and so we're 
we're listening to our, our tribes, we're connecting them to um, regional resources or um, what have you. And so we're trying to build a policy platform that can be taken to um, not only at the regional level, but a national level, so on the hill. So that's really where tribes can have an impact, a collective impact um, with the sovereignty, the food sovereignty piece and, and influence uh, agencies like the USDA and um, things like that. Um, and then we have the education work group with the coalition is really about revitalizing and protecting that traditional knowledge around food. And so as mentioned earlier, you might often hear um, some folks say fry bread is a traditional food. <laughs> and the um, me being someone who has uh, some nutritional background, I'm like, no, not fry bread. So, but it, the, anyway, so traditional food you can think of here in the Northwest as things like, you probably hear like salmon, uh, different types of berries, whether that's huckleberries or elderberries or choke cherries and um, different plants like steam nettle. Um, the, especially in the Puget Sound area, you're talking about all the delicious seafood um, and seaweed, which I told Victoria I'm not a huge fan of seaweed, but she lo <laughs> loves it. <laughs> but the clams and the oysters, and then you can move more inland and you know, the deer, the elk, um, things like that, and, and different types of fish too, not just salmon. So those are the things we're really talking about when we talk about protecting these foods. It's those first foods that the tribes are, are trying to protect because there are a lot of um, issues around access and availability at times. Um, it's not always easy to have access to some of these traditional um, areas where you can gather or hunt if the treaty rights aren't there. Or if you don't live on your reservation, you live in a different reservation or a different community, that might mean you don't have access to these foods because you're not a tribal member within that tribe. And so that's another thing, another implication to think about. So those are just some of the things that the Tribal Food Sovereignty Coalition look at and, and um, are trying to address. And um, as a the Tribal Epidemiology Center, um, we provide trainings and um, technical assistance opportunities. We've done um, trainings around food sovereignty assessments. And so that's really just like a community-based level assessment just to address like, how does the community think of food sovereignty? Do they think of food sovereignty? And what are the, um, programs that might be available or um, education opportunities. Uh, we've done trainings uh, around policy and food code and often the, um, our hands-on skill building trainings happen at our annual gathering, which I'm so sad did not happen last year, but I'm, I'm hopeful <laughs> either this year or next we can get back together as a large coalition group and um, resource share and, and learn new skills. Um, and then more specifically, going back to COVID-19 and the response to that. So we currently have a partnership with UW and WSU um, to adapt the food insecurity during COVID-19 survey. And this was a, a survey that was originally launched by UW to the state of Washington as like a general population um, wide survey. Um, and we are approached to help adapt this survey to specifically look at what the food insecurity during COVID looked like for tribal communities and tribal people. And so we um, did qualitative interviews with tribal leaders and tribal program staff to inform us of, of uh, their priorities and needs to continue the response of um, food access, distribution, and security during during the pandemic and after this pandemic. Um, and so we're really hoping to get some really good uh, feedback and information when we launch our online survey so that we can give this information to tribal leaders and, and communities um, 
So they're able to advocate for the resources that they need and not just them, but we can advocate for them too at these platforms like ATNI. Um, so also we did receive some COVID-19 rapid response funds from the Native American Agriculture Fund. And that was really to uh, look at doing a feasibility assessment and a model business plan around establishing a Northwest regional intertribal food production and marketing hub. And it's really exciting. And I wish I could share a lot more about it, but there's just no time. I could probably take 40 minutes just describing that. But just to say, um, there is a lot of movement out there right now um, that came from, I think, this pandemic because when food distribution halted to some of our rural areas um, and our rural tribes because of um, the disruption due to COVID-19, there is kind of this shock of, okay, we need to be able to feed our people when we cannot rely on big, large food distribution from big ag. And so what's our response to that? More focus on our local and regional food systems. And um, I think the, the model that we developed with these COVID-19 rapid response funds does just that, um, not just local and regional, but tribal and looking to reestablish some of those old traditional um, trading routes because one thing that this farm would like to do is purchase you know, other native um, food producers products as well as sell their foods to other tribes. And so just reestablishing that intertribal um, network for, for food distribution and also being able to respond more quickly to things like a pandemic or other um, emergency to ensure that our tribes in the region are um, are, are well fed and with good nutrition. Uh, but it looks like we've kind of reached the <laughs> 40 minute mark, 41 minute mark. So um, I'll just stop there. And if Yona or Victoria have anything they want to add, I'll stop sharing my, my screen too. Oh my gosh, thank you so very much. I'm gonna um, just hop in, but Victoria, there'll be lots more time to, to uh, hear from you again. Thank you both so much also for sharing your um, information and we, and we are able to share the PDF of your slides with students so they can review that information as well. Thank you for that presentation. Um, this year, I often say to my the presenters, you know, I wish you were in the room with us, you could hear 300 students just clapping in appreciation for you and, um, you know, really having a moment to interact with you and to ask you some follow up questions. And so I try to ch channel the students in asking just a couple of follow up questions. Um, and um, Nora, I just wanted to start with you because you left us with some really juicy bits there at the end. <laughs> So I'm hoping um, that you might be willing to tell us just a little bit more about some of these amazing programs and opportunities that seem to be kind of on the verge of rolling out or in the process of rolling out, um, you know, and, and maybe couple that a little bit with sort of the, the sense that you have about the opportunity that exists here around food. And um, Victoria, I'd, I'd love to hear from you as well um, on this kind of the potential of food as part of health um, after that, if that's okay. So Nora, please. Yeah, I almost am overwhelmed by that question because I don't know where to begin other than um, with that regional food hub in particular, um, you know, this was a farm that uh, is not is non-native owned, um, but looked to sell the farm to, um, you know, tribe or tribes they were open to, you know, intertribal collaboration or one tribe take it on. Um, and I think they're currently in talks with that. So I don't want to give up so much information, but, um, but really making sure that it is tribally led and operated and also not just like walking away either. So the, the farm, um, the farmer and the owner um, you know, they are going to stay on and help transition the team 
over to a tribally led um, organization or, you know, um, tribally led farm and do help them with any technical assistance or learning or, you know, just the transitioning of that. And a really exciting piece that I think will be added um, to this farm is a intertribal nonprofit arm of it that would serve more as a, a learning center for other potential native food producers. And you've seen like through, I think it's WSU, it, it might be UW as well. There's um, these, these programs you can have access to, to learn about business development and, you know, financials and how do you start your business and things like that. But this would be with the native uh, indigenous framework or lens um, and what that looks like because there there are I will say there are mixed feelings about if um, a tribe is looking to sell a traditional food like let's say uh, salmon <laughs> I know that there's um, mixed feelings about that because it's a first food and it's not meant to be monetized right so that's one argument um, another is like well um, we do also have, you know, the opportunity here to have some sort of economic development and help with sustainability for the tribe. And I just got to say, that's where its sovereignty comes in. So each tribe can determine for themselves if that's something they want to embark on, just like any individual can, like a fisherman can decide for themselves, are they going to sell their fish or, or not? And that's kind of the beauty of it. And so having this nonprofit side just to, you know, maybe have some food safety courses to ensure that, you know, the safety of the product or what does that look like? Or what does marketing look like? Or um, things like that. And, and they might include more traditional um, and cultural activities, you know, for the community. And it's just a really exciting project that, you know, they're, they're working on. And so I can always share more when that all rolls out so you can keep your students or yourself informed. <laughs> yes, um, please do. <laughs> yeah, and I, I will just say also, so that really came out of COVID, um, just the pressure of, you know, getting food to people and, and this farm in particular works really closely with like Northwest Harvest. And so Northwest Harvest is a huge organization that works on getting food into the food banks and out to the community. Um, and one tribe that I got to talk to that lives up in the Olympic Peninsula really flourished out of the necessity of getting food to their people. Before COVID, their food pantry was really empty. They said the only thing they had in it was like a big bag of white rice and some beans. And that nobody went to the food pantry because one, there's nothing really in there and also the stigma of going. So it wasn't really utilized. Well, when COVID happened and there's shutdowns into other tribal communities, shut down, you know, you can't go anywhere. Um, the fear of even going to the grocery store, which mind you is like 27 miles away. Um, they needed food. And so they worked really hard to stock this pantry full of really good fresh produce from their garden, which is entirely volunteer <laughs> based. They're not getting paid to be gardeners and <laughs> also the food pantry people. So, you know, it really took the heart of this family that work for the food pantry to make it to where people felt welcomed and okay to go to the food pantry. They're just like, no, this is here for you. It's awesome because there's healthy, good food in here. <laughs> and if it wasn't COVID, they would let them go in and do like, they're actually shopping rather than like, you know, here's, here's your box of food. But because of COVID, it had to be like a drive-through <laughs> process. But they said it, it's really helped. And at least, you know, folks are, are getting nutritious food during this time. And now they have a really well-stocked pantry to do that. Um, and that was that was hopeful for me that they're thinking about it in different ways now and looking to expand their garden. Um, yeah, so that's just one other example. 
Fantastic, Nora. Thank you so much. And thank you for um, for a, a really beautiful answer to a big question <laughs> that I posed. So I really appreciate that, um, both the, okay. the additional detail and the kind of vision of, um, you know, that, that can be informed by the possibility even within this pandemic and the potential for that. So um, thank you. And Victoria, I would love to hear from you, you know, also from the perspective of the organization more broadly, is food kind of this growing theme for health? Is food, you know, it seems like, and Nora, as you described, kind of a lot has happened in recent years, you know, where there's this organizing around food. And is that something that's happening um, or might happen more broadly? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I'm absolutely thrilled at um, the expansion of the projects that we've had we have at um, the board but this has been a movement um, a grassroots movement um, among American Indian Alaska Native people for quite some time and I would love to say that we're absolutely on the cutting edge but there are many many people who went before Nora or I who um, did a lot of work around indigenous food systems for their own tribes but there's this really um, neat genesis of the work and people coming together to work more broadly across the region. And I would argue that it's also broadly across the United States. Um, almost every um, area that we work with has some sort of food work going on. Some of it came out of the Good Health and Wellness in Indian Country Initiative. Quite frankly, I think there were new developments there. But I also know that there were aunties and grandmas and grandpas and uncles quietly working away in the background um, on food sovereignty and food related issues. Um, you know, the tradition of food is handed down and because so many of our tribes hand down information by oral tradition, um, you know, the elders are the ones who are, are the cultural brokers often who can hand down that information to younger people who take up the baton, so to speak, and then maybe run with it and, um, you know, go in new ways and new creative ways. I mean, there's all sorts of information, I think, on the internet now, uh, maybe not specific information because there's still some things that are held close to the heart by tribal people, but there's a lot of information, a lot of things you can learn just by doing some exploration on tribal websites. And certainly if people were interested in the Northwest, um, all you have to do is go to our organization's website and you can link to any of our tribe's websites from there. So that's a good way to get more familiar. I think for me though, that there's a really cool intersection that we haven't really talked too much about and that's food as medicine um, and healing of traditional foods. And for me trained as a Western trained dietitian, very conventionally trained, I would say, um, at the two great institutions in the state of Washington, although there are other great institutions in Washington as well, but the two biggies are in my background. Um, and so, you know, very conventionally trained in that more traditional model of education um, that one would find in someone who's had some years experience. Um, this is so exciting for me because there's there's, in, you know, the cultural knowledge of American Indian and Alaska Native people and the tribal people in the Northwest. And there's a Western science kind of knowledge about how specific nutrients interact together. And there's a really cool place together where we get some traditional foods sort of analyzed for nutrient content. And there's some work going on around that and sort of taking the best of Western and the best of traditional science and medicine and melding the two together. And I think we come to a place of really amazing outcomes. And that includes the entire food system in this case. It's not like, you know, we're gonna go up to a tribe and say, hey, manufacture us a pill to fix whatever, but learn about those foods, learn about the nutrients, and then just, you know, remind ourselves, especially for those of us who may be coming out of a more Western medicine background, Remind yourself of where some of the medicines we use today came from. So we have digitalis from foxglove. Well, that's an indigenous plant in the Northwest. If you haven't seen one, uh, go hiking and you'll find one, I'm sure. And then, you know, aspirin coming from the bark of a tree. It's like so much is already in our Western medicine 
that was taken from traditional knowledge um, or developed from traditional knowledge. And now it's a time to sort of reclaim that and put it all back together in a system that benefits um, American Indian, Alaska Native people and you know, use that synergistically so that we can make the most progress to eliminate health inequities that we can. So that's why Thank I'm excited. You. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, no, clearly. And it came through, it came through from, from both of you, from each of you. And um, I thought that was just a, a really beautiful way to also maybe wrap up the presentation here and um, to really see food as part of health, food as part of um, cultural knowledge as central to it. And even, you know, the the um, activity that you described, Nora, that I referred to as happening within the last few years, it's happening maybe on websites in the last few years, or it's happening kind of, you know, um, it's, it's always been there, like you're saying. And I love the examples, Victoria, that you just gave of how Western medicine has learned and is based on more more traditional knowledge. In fact, when you uh, had mentioned tech in your presentation, I thought at first, oh, is it traditional ecological knowledge that she's referring to? <laughs> so um, I also wanted to just uh, make sure to thank you for your just your your um, depth of attention to detail and your thoughtfulness with which you invited the conversation amongst yourselves and the conversation I'm sure that students will engage with around language, around respect, around um, also context for, for um, concepts like food access, you know, and thinking about it beyond um, just a receiving of food that's provided, but rather a community endeavor that really leads, you know, from, from a tech perspective, maybe traditional ecological knowledge perspective, um, more to a place of food sovereignty as, a, as an inevitable eventual um, landing spot for these for these ideas and I your presentation was so rich I hope you'll um, keep us apprised but like you said there are so many resources that are online you shared wonderful resources so if you haven't had a chance yet um, to check those out please make sure to check under module seven um, and I also wanted to give a small shout out to our own campus activities in these areas. Our University of Washington Farm has been partnering with Washavalt, the intellectual house at the university. And there is, a, in fact, a, a food sovereignty program that um, is being, you know, it, there's, there's much activity around food sovereignty at the University of Washington, but specifically um, on the university grounds, which are on traditional and ancestral and unceded territory. And so there's there's work happening in our backyard in, in this amazingly rich and productive region. And I'm so grateful for your time and expertise that you were willing to share with us today. Thank you so much. Great, thank you for inviting us both. <laughs>